basically what I've got here is a poll that I did on Instagram, basically asking people like, how do they feel about hypotheticals? Uh, so it was pretty interesting. Uh, a few people hated them, but it was by far like not the majority at all. Um, some people loved them, but most people said it depends on the hypothetical, right? And so I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, let me just change something here real quick. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting and I think it's kind of telling. And I think part of the reason is, is because hypotheticals are actually so powerful. Uh, and so I'm gonna just, let me just like lay it out there. I am a big fan of hypotheticals. I really like hypotheticals. And so that's the bias coming in, uh, coming into this. I also wanna say too, this is a subject that my patrons voted on and I couldn't figure out exactly how to make it into like, um, like a very tight um, sort of video essay thing. And so I decided that it would be better as a live stream. This is also one of these things that I'm still kind of thinking through a bit. So, you know, some of my views are like really like crystallized and like, you know, I've done a lot of research and empirical work and kind of pressure tested them. Uh, and then some of my views are kind of more fluid. I'm still exploring them. This is kind of the latter category. Okay, so this is kind of more like, um, this is kind of like me just kind of exploring this right now. Uh, well, a little more than just exploring it, but it's more on the fluid end of the spectrum. Okay, so anyway. Uh, what do I think this shows about the depends on the hypothetical? Well, I think it's because hypotheticals are powerful and a lot of people have been able to use hypotheticals to get people to see things that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to see, right? That's kind of the power of hypotheticals uh, is that just compared to just normal like language and normal kind of sentences and things and normal descriptions, hypotheticals can really kind of dig in in a way that they can't. Uh, and so obviously some people like them, but then I think most people have also been on the other end of the hypothetical um, where the hypothetical has made the person feel very, made you feel very uncomfortable, right? Maybe it's made you question something. Obviously, I'm sure hypotheticals have been used on you like for veganism. Maybe some hypotheticals even convinced you to go vegan. Uh, they kind of dig in. They can really kind of, um, I guess, sort of shake your sense of identity, shake maybe your uh, faith in uh, your philosophy or your certain positions and things like that. And so I think that's probably why people say it depends on the hypothetical. Now, some hypotheticals are just like straight up annoying, right? And people are giving them in bad faith and things like that. So obviously there's that too. But I think that, you know, I think we've all been on the receiving end of a hypothetical that really like shook us a bit or really like made us think a lot differently about things. Uh, and so I, I really, I really enjoyed this poll basically. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to get into it now. We're going to kind of start at the beginning, like what hypotheticals are for, and then we'll kind of get into what my, my insights into hypotheticals are. Okay, so hypotheticals, I basically see them as a sort of pragmatic thing, and what they're made for is basically to challenge cultural, societal, and selfish intuitions. So things like racism, carnism, uh, you know, charitable giving is an interesting one. If you've ever like, read about hypotheticals on that, those can be um, pretty revealing, I think. Uh, traditions, all those sorts of things, right? And so they can also kind of reveal your underlying principles and values, and then of course show you inconsistencies in them. Uh, this is like the big vegan one, right? Is that, you know, we, we're telling non-vegans, right? They already have the values that, you know, they don't want to harm animals unnecessarily. Uh, and then their behavior is inconsistent with those values. Uh, but of course, this can apply to all sorts of things. And I think that's one of the really strong things with hypotheticals, right? And then they also make uh, the abstract concrete. Uh, so, you know, if I say, like, do you think, like, harming animals is wrong? Or do you think animals deserve to not be harmed or something? That's one thing. But if I say, if a dog walks by and I take a knife out and slash their throat open, that's another, right? And so I've taken the abstract and made it concrete. And concrete tends to be, you know, as far as human psychology, tends to be more evocative, more convincing, things like that. Okay, so how do they achieve this? Well, I already alluded to some ways that they achieve this, right? Uh, but I think an interesting thing that hypotheticals can do is that they can isolate variables. So scientific experiments, they kind of isolate variables in like the, the real world, like tangible variables, whereas hypotheticals can isolate variables in our minds. And so like, let me just give you this example. So this is a kind of common thing like you might say, right? Let's say if you saw a dog walking down the street, would it be okay for you to go up and kill the dog uh, to eat them, right? And then the same question, but for a pig. Now, when you give that to someone, they might be saying something like, okay, but is there other food I could eat? Or, or is the dog a part of a family? Um, is the dog or pig, in, is the dog like a uh, danger to you? Are they attacking you? Something like that, right? They're gonna like throw up these other like questions about it. And with a hypothetical, you can just say, no, all those things are the same, right? You've got other food. They're not part of a family. The dog isn't attacking you. And so it lets you kind of pull apart all those variables so that you just have the relevant variables, right? So now we're just kind of comparing a dog and a pig uh, and we can kind of go from there, right? 
And so I think this is just a really powerful thing that hypotheticals do um, because it's kind of like, it's like a mirror of actual science in some ways, you know, loosely, of course. Um, whatever, essentially. Okay, so, so then my, my contention here and my claim, and I'll kind of contradict this and you'll see, see that in a second, but that I don't really think there are bad hypotheticals. And what I mean by that is that virtually every hypothetical is gonna tell you something about either the way you think or what you value, right? And so to that end, I really like hypotheticals. I think they're really good, uh, really good tools for kind of delving into your own uh, psyche and beliefs and epistemology. The problem with hypotheticals, the big problem I think is not the hypothetical itself, but rather determining what the hypothetical demonstrates, okay? And so we're going to see that in an example uh, given to me by an anti-vegan troll. Uh, so an anti-vegan troll said this to me once. Uh, this is cleaned up a little, so it's, it's not quite as, I think theirs was not as grammatically nice here. Um, but they said, if there was a burning building and inside is a human, a dog, and an ant colony, right? Would you expect a firefighter to risk life and limb to save the ant colony? And should they save them over the human and dog? Okay, so the question is, is this a good hypothetical? Well, I think it is uh, because I think it shows you a lot of potentially interesting things, right? So I think most people are going to agree that, or, or rather, I think most vegans are going to agree that a human, a dog, and an ant are going to have the same intrinsic value, right? They're all sentient beings who uh, deserve to live and don't deserve to be harmed and things like that, right? Um, but once you've established that a bunch of individuals all have the same intrinsic value, right, and you're put in a position where like, you can only save one of them, then you have to go to other factors. You have to find some sort of symmetry breaker, right? So like, imagine the same hypothetical, and I say, okay, it's Jonas Salk, um, some random accountant in Ohio, and then Hitler, right? Well, and Jonas Salk, by the way, is the guy who developed the uh, polio vaccine. Okay, well, we agree that all humans have the same intrinsic value, right? So we think those three humans all have intrinsic value. However, if, if we have to only save one of them, we need to look at something else. So what else might we look at, right? Well, maybe we'd look at extrinsic value, right? So. Jonas Salk is going to create a polio vaccine and Hitler is going to do all the stuff Hitler does. And so we might say, okay, well, while I agree that they all have the same in intrinsic value, their extrinsic value is extremely different. So I'd prefer, you know, maybe not to kill any, any humans who have intrinsic value, but if I had to, then maybe I would go to something else, right? Or maybe you'd look at like the probability of sentience, right? So like humans, you know, well, I guess we can't be 100% certain that, that anyone but us is sentient, right? But maybe you think other humans are like 99.9% .9 chance that they're sentient. And maybe you think a dog is like 98 or something, you know, somewhere in there, right? We're, we're pretty sure both of them are pretty sentient, but maybe we can kind of distinguish. And ants, I don't know, you know, it gets a little, it gets a little stickier with, uh, with insects. I don't know, maybe they're 50%, 60% chance they're sentient, whatever. So maybe we would use that if we have to kill one of them or if we have to save one of them, maybe we could use that as a thing, right? Um, also like how much life do they have yet to live, things like that. Uh, but then we in introduce something else in the hypothetical. It makes it even more complicated because it's not asking what you would do. It's asking like if you would expect a firefighter to do this. Um, and so now it's like, well, okay, what's the chance that the firefighter is going to die in the fire? Is it a 50% chance? Is it a 1% chance? Is it a 0.00002% chance? You know? Um, and then also like, does it matter that the, that the firefighter signed up to be a firefighter and like knew they were going to be putting themselves at risk, right? And so you've got all these questions that really, I think, can form like a really rich, interesting sort of, uh, I guess, journey into your mind, you know, to try to figure out what you value, what you would do in these situations, you know, and I think it does kind of hone your thinking and your, your, your sort of epistemology and your sort of phil philosophical stance, right? And so I think that it, it can be quite good. However, <laughs> this hypothetical was clearly, and I'm mind reading a little bit, but this was an anti-vegan troll. Uh, this was clearly put to me as if it was like some knockdown argument against veganism, right? And so while earlier, like I said, I think the hypothetical is good in that it probes a bunch of interesting things and interesting questions, it doesn't really do what the person thinks it does or wants it to do. You know what I mean? So let's kind of talk about that in relation to this. So I'm calling this a sort of type one hypothetical. This is just a term I made up just for this. Uh, so I'm calling this a type one hypothetical, which is a good hypothetical, but that has bad conclusions or that has like weird conclusions, right? So again, it can be shown, uh, it can show interesting things, but if it's used as a rebuttal against veganism or as an excuse to eat pigs, chickens, and cows, it really doesn't scan, right? So like I could answer that hypothetical a bunch of different ways 
and it would still be wrong to eat pigs, chickens, and cows, right? Um, it, it, you know, it, it may add a layer of nuance to a corner case, but to the core of the philosophy and to the core of like the behavioral output of that philosophy, it does virtually nothing. Like imagine if I like imagine if I even answered this. Imagine if I said I don't think the firefighter should go in to save any of them. I just think that like even if it's a low risk, I just don't think the firefighter should do that, right? That would still be irrelevant as a rebuttal to veganism because like the last time I checked, you don't have to run into a burning building to grab tofu, right? <laughs> so going into the grocery store and picking up, you know, tofu or beans or whatever isn't risking your life. You know, you're not like going into a burning building. And so I think that's kind of like one of the first things. And I'll talk about in a second here how you actually deal with those and why this is important to recognize, uh, because I think there is something potentially powerful here. So the other type of hypotheticals that are like bad, I call a type two, and these are mostly just bad for pragmatic reasons, right? So one reason is like maybe if they're too unrealistic. So uh, something I say to some people sometimes is like, okay, uh, this is kind of what I use kind of in more debate broy context actually. Uh, if someone is like really like, oh, I don't care about animals or it doesn't matter what happens to them. I say, okay, well, imagine a dog is walking by and a tree branch falls on their head, right? Do you think anything bad has happened? If you could have pressed a button to not have the tree branch hit the dog in the head, would you? Uh, and so, you know, earlier I said about, you know, if a dog walks by and I slash their throat open, like, is that good or whatever? What, the problem with that one is that it doesn't pull apart the actor and the action. And so because there's an actor in it, me or, or them or whoever I say, right, a lot of people will get distracted and be like, well, that's just a sick thing to do. That takes like a, you know, an, a, a bad mind to do that. Or that's a psychopath who would do that, right? And so it kind of gets them distracted. And so I kind of like this one more because it's just like sort of an act of nature, right? And so it, it focuses less on the actor like perpetrating uh, something and more on just like the act itself and, and the victim who's getting hurt by it. So that's nice. I like to use that sometime. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. So Contrast that, a branch falling on a dog's head. Now imagine if I give the same hypothetical, but I say something like this. Instead of a tree branch, this interdimensional portal opens up and a bunch of like tiny plastic T-Rexes fall on the dog's head, right? That hypothetical isn't any less valid than the first hypothetical. They're both probing the same thing. They're both demonstrating the same thing about sentience, about not wanting to be harmed, about people's intuitions about like a dog getting harmed or a pig getting harmed. Um, but it just adds in this fantastical element that people can latch on to. So that's what I, what I mean when I say pragmatic problems, right? So the more fantastical elements you add on, the more someone can latch on to that and be like, oh, well, um, I, I think that's too unrealistic. So I, I'm just gonna like, throw out this hypothetical, right? Uh, so that's like one thing. And that's a kind of unrealistic one because I would never say that. But um, if you watch my videos, you know, I often ask people, you know, uh, if a pig could talk, like, what would you say to them if you were about to put them in the gas chamber, right? And then after like whatever answer they give me, I'll typically say, okay, if an alien had you in that position and they said that, like, would you find that to be a good, a good reason or whatever? And so there's another one where, okay, well, aliens, we've never seen aliens, they don't exist or whatever. So someone can derail and be like, well, that's unrealistic, right? Um, and so as much as you can, I think you want to try to limit those things. I put them in sometimes because I think they are effective uh, in certain instances. But sometimes when you throw in too many, it just gives people hooks to like uh, shut down or, or you know, um, sort of dodge the question. The second type of type two, again, more pragmatic problems, is stuff like um, anything that would be like offensive to people. So anything that would draw out a strong emotional reaction. So any of like these things I'm pointing to here, I don't know if saying them gets like, <laughs> I don't know. I know on uh, TikTok sometimes if you say those things, you get like uh, down, uh, uh, downvoted in the algorithm or whatever. Um, so if you have these sort of potentially offensive uh, hypotheticals, I think you want to kind of do like a sort of Goldilocks principle. So uh, I think most of us have heard this before, like when someone says, oh, I'm just going to do meatless Mondays. And we, and like, you know, and then someone's like, okay, well, imagine if I beat my wife like six days a week and didn't beat her Monday, would you think that is all right? Um, again, I think that the underlying principle, the underlying logic behind that is pretty solid. But um, it has, it really has the, the ability to be very polarizing and to cause the person to shut down, uh, especially depending on like the actual dynamics of like who you're talking to. So like if me, a guy is talking to a woman and I bring that up like as my hypothetical, it's it's got a really high risk of backfiring and not going very well. And I've used it only once or twice in that scenario and it did not work either time. It was, it was pretty bad. So I think you want to adjust to the situation on the fly. So like if we think about like what's maybe the riskiest one, if we, we say something like we did this to the partner six days a week and not seven, right? 
or maybe verbally abused is a little less risky. And maybe kicked a dog is a little less risky. And then like the least risky is like stole a pack of gum six days a week instead of seven, right? So you can kind of turn this dial on the hypotheticals and calibrate it to the conversation based on kind of what the person's thinking. Um, I personally, in this instance, just for reference, I personally like to use the kick the dog one. I think it, it introduces the least extra variables. Um, and I think enough people care about dogs that it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, it's also kind of a direct comparison if I'm talking about herding pigs and then herding dogs, you know. Uh, so I like that one a lot. Another thing I sometimes do here is like, instead of like picking group X and being like, well, this group was oppressed or hurt or whatever, things like that. Um, sometimes instead I'll, I'll do what I call like the redhead thought experiment. I say, okay, well, what if I didn't like redheads and I, you know, um, killed them or I didn't like redheads and I did like, uh, you know, I don't know, I imprisoned them or something, right? Um, that's a way of getting at the same principles that some of these more uh, offensive, I guess, hypotheticals would get at, uh, but doing it in just like a slightly less uh, defense drawing out way, right? That's going to draw slightly less defensiveness um, if, if you do something like that. But, you know, use to taste, uh, it really depends on the situation. I definitely think using the really harsh ones is good sometimes. I think you just kind of got to feel it out a little bit. Um, and then the final type two that I have here is just too complicated. So the too complicated in the sense that if you're having an outreach conversation or if this is a casual conversation, sometimes introducing really complex hypotheticals, it's just too much. Like the person doesn't want to think about it. You don't have enough time to go through it. Um, like, like the one I gave earlier, for instance, like the burning building one with like all the different like variables. And then there was also the firefighters and like, you know, th there's a lot there to dig through. And so I think ones like that can kind of be too complicated maybe for just like a normal conversation. Uh, but they might be more appropriate in like extended discussions or people who are like philosophically minded and things like that. I think they can actually be uh, good sometimes there. All right. So how do we actually deal with these hypotheticals, right? So this is dealing with type one. So remember, these are the ones that um, have a weird conclusion or the conclusion isn't what the person like thinks it is, right? And so I'm going to use the desert island example here. Uh, and <laughs> I don't even know why I'm saying this. For those of you who don't know the uh, desert island example, this is when someone says, you know, if you were on the desert island with a pig, uh, would, you, would you eat the pig? So I think the first thing is this. You want to communicate with people in the way that they like to communicate, right? And so if someone is giving you hypotheticals, that probably means that they like to communicate in hypotheticals. And so I think to just shut down the hypothetical and be like, look, I'm not talking about hypotheticals, I'm talking about X, Y, Z. I think that's maybe not always the best thing to do because I think the person can walk away thinking, oh, well, they just couldn't answer my hypothetical. And even if it's not that, that bad, I think that person enjoys talking in hypotheticals. And if you engage with them in that way, I think they're gonna be more drawn into the conversation. They're gonna see you as more similar to them, which is always a good thing as far as like a persuasive standpoint. Uh, people tend to like and listen to people who they think are more like them. Uh, so I think if you can kind of roll with the hypothetical with them, that's probably better. Uh, so remember, I think this is why this is important to understand that even if you give a weird answer to a hypothetical or a hypothetical seems tough, remember that hypothetical doesn't necessarily demonstrate what the person wants it to. And you can just say that. So when the person asks this question, they are seeing it as some sort of rebuttal of veganism. Like, oh, if they say they'd eat the pig, veganism disproven, right? But it doesn't actually demonstrate that. And you can just tell them that, right? So what I would do is I would kind of confirm, I would I, I'd maybe just ask a couple questions just to kind of show the weakness of the hypothetical and then just kind of answer it pretty plainly, right? So maybe you'd say something like, look, um, so I just, just so we're clear, right? Um, I, I'm assuming that this island doesn't have a bunch of plant food that the pig and myself can eat. No, okay. And I also assume I know I'm getting rescued soon, right? Because like, even if I ate the pig, you know, that's gonna what, like last me like maybe a week before the pig's body starts to like decompose. So like, right, so like just point out that there's other things that like they haven't even thought of that what, like would be relevant to, to, to kind of have in there, right? And then just answer it plainly, right? And I've heard uh, vegans answer this in basically broadly two different ways. Uh, some people I've heard say, you know, in, in a situation of necessity, this would be an okay thing to do, right? And then I've heard other people say like, Okay, well, just because I'm in danger, that doesn't justify me taking someone else's life, right? That doesn't, that, that uh, unfortunate thing on my part doesn't justify an injustice on someone else's part, right? And so you can answer that question either way you want, right? Whatever your particular answer to that is, answer it, answer it in the way that's honest to you, basically, is what I'm saying, right? 
but then you can say more, like you can follow up. And this person might be like, ah, oh, see, I told you, right? They might, they might be getting excited like with, with whatever one that you say, you know? Um, but then you can just point out to them like, well, what do you think that demonstrates? Or you can say, just tell them what it demonstrates. You can say, well, that's a situation of necessity, right? Like, but that's not really the situation you're in or we're in, right? And so then you can just give them a counter hypothetical. Now, remember, the reason this is important is because assuming that they are giving hypotheticals, right? That means they probably like hypotheticals. So if you speak to them in hypotheticals, that's probably going to work better. So don't dodge the hypothetical, engage in the kind of conversation they want to engage in, and then just give them that, that counter hypothetical, right? And the counter hypothetical is, is obvious. I would even kind of try to keep it similar to their hypothetical. So you can say, okay, well, imagine that you and a pig were on an island and there was just unlimited plant food and you could be as healthy as you want and the pig could be as healthy as they wanted, right? Would you, would you kill the only other sentient being on that island, your only potential friend, right? You know, would you be eating the plant food and be like, wow, I really just want to eat them and pull out a knife and slash their throat open, right? Because that's actually more like the situation we're in right now. We have tons of plant food we can eat. We don't have to pay people to kill pigs and uh, cows and things like that, right? And so I think that's a better way to go about it because you've basically demonstrated that the, the hypothetical didn't imply what they wanted. And in your counter hypothetical, right, I, th I don't think most people are going to say they're going to kill the pig. And so it's kind of one of those things where you kind of beat them at their own game sort of thing. Um, and you, you engage them in the way that they want to be engaged with, right? The other thing too about answering plainly is that you're modeling how you want the conversation to go. So if you keep kind of dodging or being like, that's stupid or things like that, they're going to kind of take, take on that frame, right? They're going to do the same things. When you give a hypothetical or when you say something, they're going to say, ah, well, that's stupid. I don't like that, whatever. Um, and so by just answering plainly, right? You're modeling for them how you want them to answer. And so you answer it. And then when you give them the hypothetical, then they're more likely to answer it plainly as well, rather than like being like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't think that's like, you know what I mean? Like squirming a little bit. It's no guarantee, but I think it does uh, up your chances. Yeah. All righty. Here's another weird thing about hypotheticals. This is like really getting kind of into like the nitty gritty, uh, but I put it in here. I, I could... I was going to go even further with this, but I wanted to keep it kind of pra practical. So the weird thing about hypotheticals is that sometimes they're actually smuggling in multiple questions that seem like one question. So here's a fun hypothetical. Again, remember, I like hypotheticals. I know some of you don't, but <laughs> I think they're really fun to answer. Okay, so imagine that your partner was infected with a virus, right? And it wouldn't kill them. They're immune. But they're going to infect a billion people uh, unless you murder them right now. So the question is, uh, should you murder them, right? So this is like one of those sort of impossible hypotheticals, right? But I think that it only seems impossible because we kind of want this like singular answer to it rather than like what the hypothetical is actually kind of probing at, which is like a bunch of different questions. So I'm sorry if this gets a little in the weeds here, but I just figured I'd throw it in. Um, so one question might be something like, what is the stance independent morally correct thing to do? So imagine you're floating up in the ether. This is like John Rawls' um, veil of ignorance, right? You're just like a locus of consciousness. You don't know who you're going to be in the world, right? All right, do you want to come into the world where a billion people die of the virus or only one person dies who just got infected, right? Because you can be any of them. You're, you might be, become any of them, right? So that stance independent question is kind of like one type of question, right? But then there's kind of two other questions. So one is like, what would you actually do as a person, right? So let's say that I answered that the stance independent thing was to, to kill my partner, right? To murder them. I could answer that that's like the stance independent correct thing to do while still saying I wouldn't actually do it. Like maybe I think that's the correct thing to do, but I myself could never actually do that, right? I would say, okay, I can't possibly do this. Um, and then there's there's also what you would actually do and then what, you th what you'd like to think you'd do, right? So, because there's also this question that people don't actually know what they're going to do in high stress environments often, you know what I mean? And so there's also this kind of question of like, what do you wish you'd do versus what would you actually do, right? And so the point here is just that these hypotheticals can sometimes be asking quite a few questions that just seem like one question. I don't quite know what the pragmatic, <laughs> like I don't know what the pragmatic terminus of this is here, uh, but I just wanted to point that out because it's something that I've noticed happen in a lot of discussions. And um, I think they kind of, I think people often answer these sort of unidimensionally when it's actually kind of like uh, multidimensional in nature, if that makes sense. I hope it did. I know that was weird. All right. So 
As far as you dealing with like a type two hypothetical, so just remember these are ones that have some sort of pragmatic issue. So maybe they're offensive or complicated or something like that or unrealistic. Well, if something's unrealistic, again, like I, I, it just doesn't matter, right? Uh, if, if the hypothetical is probing certain, um, certain values or certain principles or things like that, like irrelevant element, elements like a, an interdimensional portal, it doesn't matter, that's fine, right? Um, if it's really offensive, right, I would still say like try not to show offense or get offended or things like that uh, because you're just trying to make this conversation move along and that's going to kind of stymie it a bit. Uh, the only, you know, obviously, there's going to be extreme cases when someone says something insane where maybe you want to like, you know, check them on it or whatever. And for the most part, I don't think there's much uh, practical utility in getting offended uh, by someone else's hypothetical, right? Again, I would just kind of do the thing we said before, which is to sort of answer it plainly and then kind of throw it back at them. Because most of the time, what's going to happen with a hypothetical to a vegan is that they're going to be asking about a corner case. And what you can do is sort of like judo that hypothetical into a non-corner case. Like, what is this the realistic situation <laughs> like? You know what I mean? And put them in that situation and say, okay, well, what would you do now? Uh, and so I think that just tends to be a better, uh, better sort of way to go. Um, and that's why I don't think, I don't think we should be in the habit of, um, just dodging hypotheticals and saying, you know, cause a lot of people will be like, that's just a hypothetical. Right. And, and I understand the, uh, the, the impulse there. Again, like I said, oftentimes people are using hypotheticals and they think they're drawing some conclusion that they actually aren't. Um, but I do personally, uh, think that most of the time I hear that's just a hypothetical whenever I'm watching debates and things like that. And this is on all topics. I think most of the time it's a thought terminating cliche. And for those of you don't, who don't know, I'll just, I'll read like a formal definition of a thought terminating cliche for you real quick. So a thought terminating cliche is a form of loaded language, often passing as folk wisdom and intended to end an argument and quell cognitive dissonance. Okay, so it's things like only God can judge me or, oh, well, to each their own, or it's just a matter of opinion. It's a personal choice, things like that. Um, I would even say, well, morality is just subjective is one of those. Not that people can't actually be wanting to talk about subjective morality. It is like a rich philosophical subject. Um, but most of the time, I'm going to say 95% of the time you hear this in the street or you hear like your random friend say it or whatever. It's, in my experience, has been a thought terminating cliche, not an actual like, um, not an invitation to like open up the conversation. Uh, except insofar as sometimes I feel like it's an intellectualization. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, an intellectualization is like, when in order to try to move away from strong emotions, you try to intellectualize and really like uh, analyze something. Uh, and so I think when I hear, well, morality is just subjective, I kind of hear either a thought terminating cliche or intellectualization most of the time. But it, it can, of course, be um, talked about in good faith, but just wanted to put a pin on that. So to me, I think a lot of times, like I said, I just think this feels like a cop out to other people. I don't think it's a strong move. I think it leaves them thinking that you can't answer the hypothetical or that their hypothetical does actually show the thing they, they knew it did all along, right? Um, and again, like I said, I think, I think just answering it plainly, especially when you can counter hypothetical, just models for them how they should behave, um, the way that you want the conversation to go. Uh, and it shows them that you're like really open to looking into your own principles, right? Which is another really good thing to model because people are gonna trust you more if you're more open with yourself, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's a, a good stuff there. Um, so another thing is if they say that's just a hypothetical, uh, just to point out here, uh, this is a little bit of a debate broy point, but some people will say that's just a hypothetical or like, I never deal in hypotheticals or something like that, right? And I just, this, there's just no way this is true, okay? Everyone uses hypotheticals all the time. Uh, so like, if you ever had a shower argument, that's a hypothetical. If you've ever like weighed your options between two jobs and kind of like thought into the future, like what would it be like to work here, here? What would it be like to move here, here? Um, if you've ever like, thought about asking out your crush and like, oh, I could say this or I could say this, right? These are all hypotheticals that you're running on yourself. They're simulated scenarios that probably won't happen or they probably won't happen how you think they're going to happen, right? They're used as a way to practice something, as a way to get a better mental grip on, on something that uh, is not actually tangible reality right now. So again, uh, you know, use that at your discretion. I think that it is like a, a point to bring up when someone says like, I just don't ever deal in hypotheticals. I just don't think that can possibly be true. Um, and one thing here, I've already touched on this. The thing I think to keep in the back of your mind the whole time is that difficult hypotheticals don't disprove veganism, right? So like the fact that we can construct a hypothetical um, that's difficult to figure out and that involves non-human animals isn't some silver bullet uh, against veganism, right? Every moral system has situations, real ones and hypothetical ones, that are difficult to figure out or they're ambiguous in some way and there's like no good answers, right? 
So the fact that, you know, like, like, like let's say you're a consequentialist or a virtue ethicist or a deontologist, all these things have scenarios that are weird or hard to figure out or, you know, just aren't intuitive, right? I mean, this is what philosophy, moral philosophy books are filled with. So imagine you take kind of those philosophies and then you bring into your moral community, you bring non-human animals into that moral community, right? And now all of a sudden, there's no, there's all the hypotheticals all make total sense, right? All of a sudden, like, um, you know, there's no situations of ambiguity. Everything's perfectly clear. Every vegan agrees on everything, right? That would be weird. That would be much, much weirder if that were the case, right? So the fact that difficult hypotheticals exist doesn't disprove veganism. So just always keep that in the back of your mind when someone throws one out there and keep in mind that that's what you're trying to demonstrate them, right? You don't want to just say this is a dumb hypothetical or I'm not answering that. You can just answer it and then like, you know, put that out there and kind of explain to them why this isn't as relevant as they think it is, right? So just a summary real quick. So the hypothetical here, um, in their hypotheticals, just confirm you understand, answer plainly, uh, be wary of question smuggling. Oh, another thing I didn't talk about here is that I think a good thing to do when someone asks you a hypothetical is to indicate that other vegans may answer differently, right? Say, I think this, but other vegans might answer this way or they might answer this way, right? It kind of shows that there's a diversity of opinion in the vegan community, and it also shows that you can be vegan and hold some of these different views in these sort of corner cases, right? That you can, <laughs> you know, it's not like, it's not like you have to have the exact same opinion as everyone else in the vegan community on every single question, right? Because that seems kind of like dogmatic, right? And that people don't like that. So showing that there's like a diversity of opinion within the movement, within the philosophy, right? I think is, is typically good. Um, then of course, like I said, indicate what their hypothetical actually shows and then give a counter hypothetical. And then in your hypotheticals, just be careful of adding unnecessarily complicated or fanciful elements, like I said. Um, be wary and socially calibrated when it comes to offensive elements, right? Like we talked about, try to find that like Goldilocks zone, try to find the principle, try to find the hypothetical that's going to demonstrate the principle well enough uh, to cause an emotional reaction, but not to cause defensiveness. That's your sweet spot, right? That's the Goldilocks zone. Um, and then also uh, we want to separate actor and action. Oftentimes when we don't separate actor and action, people will get hung up on the actor and how the actor is like a bad person or something like that. Um, Whereas if we do separate actor and action, then we're much more focused on the victim, right? Which is what we want to be focused on and how their experience is either good or bad or desirable or whatever, uh, rather than like, is the person is the person like mentally deranged who's like perpetrating um, the act on, on the animal, right? So yeah, uh, that's my TED talk. Um, like I said, uh, this is something, this was asked for by my patrons and I couldn't figure out a way to make it into like, a really crystallized video essay because in some sense I don't have super crystallized views on it. So I know that makes it seem like my views are super crystallized since I did like a 20, <laughs> a 20 slide PowerPoint on it. Um, but this is kind of, I guess this is kind of like for you guys, maybe it's like watching me start to try to crystallize my view uh, on hypotheticals, right? So it was like much more fluid and this is like part of my, uh, part of my, man, I keep using the word journey unironically. Uh, this is like part of my journey as I'm trying to figure out what exactly it is about hypotheticals. Um, that makes them compelling, makes them good, makes them bad, makes them pragmatic, whatever. Uh, so I'm definitely down to read more interesting things on hypotheticals, uh, but this was just kind of like dipping my toe in.